Hi, welcome back to the Peanut Podcast. I'm Lindsay Stevens. And I'm Lauren Highfield Williams. Welcome to the April episode of the podcast. The biggest news is that the voting period for the National Peanut Board referendum has wrapped up, and we're eagerly awaiting the results from USDA. We've also started our fiscal year 2025 planning. We'll be continuing with our We the Peanut campaign, but we're getting the ball rolling on some other things like our retail and shopper marketing program. So we have a lot of fun things in store for you next year. Now, moving on to the topic at hand. With the average American enjoying 7.7 pounds of peanuts a year, we can safely say America loves peanuts. But we don't just eat them. Instead, peanuts are a loud and proud part of U.S. pop culture. From YouTube videos like Peanut Butter Baby, to songs like Peanut Butter Jelly Time, to athletes like Charles Peanut Tillman, you can't escape peanuts. In this episode, we're covering peanuts and pop culture. From arts and fashion to movies and sports, we're covering the highlights when it comes to our favorite legume being in the spotlight and part of the zeitgeist of our culture. Peanuts can be found in the art world as anything from muses to the medium. Starting off with peanuts and artwork, what's a better place to start than the artist Vic Munez creating the Mona Lisa from Peanut Butter and Jelly? There's also the 20th century artist Roy Lichtenstein, who created artwork of a peanut butter cup and of a woman serving peanuts. A more modern way peanuts are used in the art world are through fashion. Brands like Kate Spade have come out with old school peanut vendor bag style purses. Another way peanuts are used in fashion today is through jewelry. We spoke with Minnie Hay Avent, who owns a jewelry line called the Gold Bug Collection. Here's Minnie. I'm Mariana Hay Avent. Um, most people call me Minnie. I um, work with my family at our jewelry store in Charleston called Krogan's Jewel Box, and um, I also have a costume jewelry line called the Goldbug Collection. My brother and sister and I are the fourth generation in our family's jewelry store, and um, when I was finishing up school, I majored in art at Clemson, and I was ready to come back to Charleston, and I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I called my mom one day and was like, I'll just come and work at Krogan's and I don't know, I'll figure it out. And she kind of challenged me and said, no, you've got to use your artistic ability and come up with something that kind of fuels your fire and um, allows you to be creative. And we need something that could be sort of an entry. We call it the entry drug now, but um, like an entry piece to Krogan's because it's an old timey story of to buzz in and people can get intimidated. So She's like, come up with something that could be kind of approachable to visitors and locals, and it could be something Charleston related. And so um, I just said, sure, fine, I'll figure something out and it'll fail and I'll be done. And so um, I, uh, we kind of came up with these golden palmetto bugs um, that we call the gold bugs um, and just sort of started it. And to my surprise, people liked them and wanted to buy them. And we're now nearly 10 years of doing it. As Minnie mentioned, she and her family have been in the jewelry business for four generations, but Minnie may be the first to create peanut-inspired jewelry. Here's Minnie with what her peanut collection includes. So um, from our peanut collection, we have a peanut charm that's pretty lifelike. It's about the size of a peanut, Um, and it looks great on just like a gold chain or layered with other pieces. And then we also have little peanut stud earrings and then a peanut drop earring that has pearls as the peanut and one is they're kind of asymmetrical sort of Italian style um but there's little peanuts in in those drop earrings um they're made out of pearls. Minnie says the idea for her peanut collection started when she was pregnant with her first child. Here's Minnie. So um my husband and I were expecting our first child and um I love to do um like little creative birthday cards and draw different things for special occasions for people. It's just like something fun. I just doodles. Um, So when we were trying to figure out a way to tell my husband's dad that we were having a baby, he already has um, a bunch of grandchildren. And so I drew, he loves boiled peanuts and always makes them and always has them. And so um, I drew like a peanut and drew one extra little peanut in the shell with a little question mark that said another peanut in the, um, in the patch or something like that. Um, it was just kind of this ongoing joke. And then, um, we, they called our baby the peanut. And so I was like, I love peanuts. And there's just like such a happy, um, I think 
most people have a happy connection to a peanut, like a memory or a, you know, reminds them of summertime with boiled peanuts. It's just like a feel good food. And it's, um, I just think it's such a happy Southern thing. And so we kind of ran with it. And um, I gave my uh, mother-in-law a peanut charm and she was the first one to get one. And so it's just kind of fun. According to many, her peanut jewelry is some of her best sellers. Here's many with more. They sort of like the um, our original earrings. I was shocked that so many people love peanut jewelry. <laughs> and so um, we, uh, the peanut studs have definitely been a bestseller. And then the large peanut charm has also just been like a really fun add on to people's collections. Um, we do a lot of personalized charms. And so it's kind of fun to just add a peanut on there too. Um, I think a lot of people, like I said, have like a familiar or a happy memory with something, um, peanut related. And then also a lot of people like nickname or, you know, have some kind of affection and nickname for peanut. Um, so I just think a lot of people can relate to them. Um, we also have okra earrings too, um, but I don't feel like they get as much of a, like, smile as the peanuts do um but their peanuts and okra are now our like probably third and fourth best sellers so who knew in addition to fashion you can also find peanuts in hollywood peanuts and movies actually go back to the very start According to an article titled A History of Movie Theater Snacks in America from Bon Appetit, Nickelodeons popped up in small towns across the country in the early 1900s. They offered five-cent silent movies, but no food. Instead, patrons purchased food and drinks from nearby restaurants and carried in their stash with them. Theaters even allowed for vendors to roam the cinemas selling popcorn and peanuts. Peanuts then found themselves in more upscale movie theaters in the 1920s and 30s. These European-style theaters were less tolerant of vendors walking around selling snacks. This led to patrons sneaking in Baby Ruth candy bars, goobers, and other peanut-filled candy to eat while watching the film. During the Great Depression, cinema owners decided to start selling refreshments and installed candy dispensers or sold space to vendors who formerly strolled the aisles to sell their peanuts and popcorn. From there, the rest is history. Peanuts have stayed a staple in movie candies from Reese's Pieces to peanut M&M's. Another entertainment venue where peanuts are permanently linked is the ballpark. When the song Take Me Out to the Ball Game was written in 1908, peanuts were already staple enough to be included in the lyrics. According to Bennett Jacobstein, author of The Joy of Ballpark Food, a pioneering ballpark concessioner named Harry Stevens sold advertising space on scorecards to a peanut company in 1895. Instead of financial payment, the company literally paid him in peanuts, which Stevens then sold at the ballparks. Steven's grandson said the peanuts were not a big hit at racetracks because people need to keep their hands free for betting. In baseball, though, the tension builds slowly. Eating peanuts gives you something to do with your hands throughout the game. Stadiums have started selling reinvented takes on classic ballpark food. At Chase Field, home of the Arizona Diamondbacks, concessions have started selling an apple pie chimichanga, topped with vanilla frozen yogurt, caramel sauce, whipped cream, cracker jacks, and strawberries. Wow, that sounds amazing. <laughs> That's not where the peanut love stops, though. The minor leagues have even gone as far as naming teams after the snack. In 2007, Albany, Georgia was the home of the short-lived South Georgia Peanuts for one season. The team ended up being followed by a camera crew and had a 10-episode documentary made about them. If you want to listen to more about peanuts and baseball, though, listen to episode 7 of the Peanut Podcast titled Peanuts Here – Peanuts, baseball, and beyond. It's not just fans who enjoy peanuts at sporting events. It's also the athletes playing. Need proof? As the story goes, before a Boston Celtics game in the late 2000s, Kevin Garnett satisfied his hunger pains with a PB&J. He then put up some impressive numbers that night, and a pregame ritual was born that led to multiple Celtics requesting their own PB&Js before games. Shortly after that, it became a team-wide request, then a league-wide request. The 2017 article titled The NBA's Secret Addiction details the extent to which PB&Js have ingrained themselves into the NBA. The Oregon Trailblazers offered 20 crustless halved PB&Js pregame, 10 of them toasted, a mandate ever since an opposing arena prepared them that way, and the Blazers' guard at the time, Damian Lillard, liked them. 
This love for PB&Js has become cross-sport even, with the Baltimore Ravens revealing that the team ate up to 7,500 Encrustables during the 2023 NFL season. You could say the talk about Encrustables reached a fever pitch, though, when NFL stars Travis and Jason Kelsey talked about them on their New Heights podcast. To learn why athletes love their PB&J so much, I spoke to Leslie Bonsey, who just retired from being the RD for the Kansas City Chiefs. Here's Leslie with a little more about herself. Sure. My name is Leslie Bonsey. I am a registered dietitian, board certified specialist in sports dietetic. I am the owner of Active Eating Advice by Leslie Bonsey and also co-founder of Performance 365 and up until recently had been the sports dietitian for the Kansas City Chief. I've had 31 years in the NFL and it's time to paint a new canvas, but I've spent a lot of my life in the world of working with the surreal and now i'm really thrilled i get to work with real people that are active there are so many people who work together to help a team be successful that it's hard to understand who does what here's leslie with a little about what it is like to be a sports rd Uh, When I started out in the field, I worked as an outpatient dietitian for a cardiac and pulmonary rehab center and had the luck of working with fabulous exercise physiologists. We had this state-of-the-art gym. We had people coming in all the time, and it's like, you know, it's not just about those exercises. It's about the hand-to-mouth exercise. It's really important. And finding those ways to collaborate, and that really planted the seed for me. "Mm, This is what I want to do with my life. So I've spent time when I was in collegiate dietetics is seeing athletes early in the morning, meaning 6 a.m. before practice, trying to catch them lunchtime between classes, getting them at the end of the day with workouts and sometimes in the evening after dinner because the world of sport is not nine to five. I'm to traveling to the Dominican Republic to work with our developmental league for Major League Baseball, to having a chance to meet with Usain Bolt. That was definitely a fangirl moment. That was really pretty darn cool to having the opportunity to work with the best of the best with you know the Kansas City Chiefs and also the Pittsburgh Steelers in their heyday. And even there, it's catching them when they are in to eat. And so at breakfast time, at lunchtime, or maybe at the end of the day, because you're, you, this is all about collision nutrition, right? It's like what you do to bring the comfort and the familiar and the enjoyment when you're playing a sport that is anything but comfortable every day. So long-winded answer to that is every day can be a little bit different. It might be a one-to-one. It might be a team talk. It might be doing some preparation for things for the players to try because they have to try before they'll buy. You know, they need to know the why for all that kind of stuff to doing writing and educational platform. I will say I never get bored because it's always something different. Leslie says the reason PB&Js are so popular for high-performing athletes are because of their nutrition and the comfort they bring. I think that oftentimes it's because it's what you have as a kid, right? This is a fun food. This is uh, a parent or guardian's demonstration of love. Let me give you a PBJ and all the owies will go away. You know, there it is right there to the fact that, and both of my kids played soccer, my boys, so I'm going to bring something with me that I did to have on a sideline that I didn't have to worry about a food safety issue. It was an easy thing for them to eat. And quite frankly, it's very simple to make, right? It does not take any time you make them ahead of time, freeze them even better, and yeah, and they're affordable. And for so many people right now, that's a really big thing. And even though they say, well, Leslie, you work with athletes. Not every athlete I work with is making millions and millions of dollars. They need to eat on a budget. They have to feed the need to succeed, and they have to do it with things that fit within their salary cap that is critically important. And at the end of the day, you know, it's so versatile. I could do peanut butter and honey, peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and banana. I could do different flavors of peanut butter. There's just so many. I can make it as a wrap. I can make it as a sandwich. I can put it on a bagel. I can mush it all up together and have it in a bite. Any which way, it's always great. You know, this is a crowd pleaser across the board. After hearing that the Baltimore Ravens consume around 7,500 Encrustables a season, I'm sure it comes as no surprise that they're popular amongst the players Leslie works with. 
I have some of my players that you know can't live without an Uncrustable. I mean, the, the day is not complete, and if we run out of them, you know, the world would stop. Now, and it's not that our chefs haven't been creative enough to say, you know what, I could make a sandwich and I could do the cookie cutter and cut it out. It's like, mm -mm, that's not the same thing. So it's like, all right, fine. So we always make sure that we have it. I, you know, I, I have guys that this is what they do before a game. Forget the steak. Forget the mac and cheese, it's this. And the reason for that, too, is because it feels more comfortable. When somebody's already nervous and hyped, the last thing they want is a big volume of food in their stomach. So the nice thing about a PBJ, I could do half. Or I could do a quarter if that's all that I can tolerate at that particular point in time. And it just works really, really well. Even as a little muffin. So we do it as a bite. Not something the size of an SUV tire. It's something small. Because again, it's just that really, it's the, it's the flavor. It's the familiar. It's the, okay, now I can settle down. And it tastes good every single time. There's no guesswork here. It's like, what was that? I don't think so. So, you know, that's the other thing. One less thing to worry about. And we can travel with them, right? I mean, that's another thing that's critically important because, you know, we have players when they're playing abroad or my Olympic athletes that travel abroad, it's, mm, I can't always find it, but I could bring it with me. Is Yes, they can get the bread, but they can bring the peanut butter, they can bring the jelly, they can pack them, and then there it is. And one less thing to worry about. Part of the fuel kit, Lindsay, that's what this is. Part of the fuel kit. A lot of this is also superstition, is don't mess with my routine. Don't mess with my ritual. This is what I've always trained with. This is what I've won with. So I'm not going to change it now. And so, okay, believe me, we've tried. We have tried. And for teams that have unlimited budget, that's great. And they can. But I'm always a, a big fan of hands-on, hands-in. And so with some of my younger athletes, we do Steel Chef Smackdown. I live in Pittsburgh, so it's kind of the city of steel. But then you have a chance to make it and do it yourself. So even something deconstructed is like a bite that's peanut butter that has some jelly and like a little bit of like a, a, a crispy rice cereal and oats. And you roll that up. Man, that is pennies. And you can pat it into ice cube trays. You can freeze them. And there it is. Again, tastes good every time. Low cost. As for the future of athletes and PB&Js, Leslie says they're not going anywhere. Here's why. Um, I think, first of all, it's a cost thing, that it is not a high price item, that it's ready to use. And there have been a lot of studies done where you ask people that are active, is if you had 10, minute, 10 more minutes in the day, would you spend those additional 10 minutes prepping food or more exercise? The answer is B. So, you know, they don't necessarily, oh, it's going to take me an hour to make something. It's like, oh, no, oh, look, I opened the jar. <laughs> and even if I don't want it, I can take it with a finger or a spoon or whatever it is. It's a really fast food to eat. Secondly, yeah, I, I think that it is so incredibly versatile. Um, last year, did some work with the USF, uh, not the USFL, it was the FCFL, which is now defunct, but it was kind of like the new gaming version of football, kind of like arena football, but strange. Um, and budget was minimal. So yeah, there weren't a lot of food choices. So it would be like plain chicken. So after a while, it's like, what? So I said, all right. He said, we have some condom. We're going to take some peanut butter. We're going to take some soy sauce. We're going to take a little honey. We're going to mix it together. I squeezed a little orange juice in there. It's like, oh, my God, that's so good. And that was then a sauce on the chicken. And the guys were like, oh, hey, come on over here and try this and do it. Using peanut butter as a base that way. Or even as peanut noodles, right? That's just a nice comforting food to eat so really one-stop shopping i think that's the advantage of it and also you can find it everywhere it is available and accessible from a dollar store to a high-end grocery store to a big box store to a bodega to a gas station mini mart everywhere you look there's peanut butter to be found to an airport even there Our exploration of peanuts and pop culture reveals the diverse and enduring impact of this seemingly humble legume. From viral videos to Mr. Peanut, peanuts and peanut butter have woven themselves into the fabric of all aspects of our lives, offering both comfort, joy, and sustenance. 
As we reflect on their presence in areas like music, sports, art, and fashion, one thing is clear. Peanuts are not just a snack. They're a cultural phenomenon that is a defining part of American life. So Lindsay, you and I, and really the whole team at MPB and our contractors and agencies really enjoyed researching and exploring ideas for this episode. I'm curious, what was an item that you were excited to find out about that we weren't able to cover in depth today? So Lord, I think that you know what I'm going to say, because this was a wild product that we found that we had never heard of, but we just you know, couldn't get enough information on it. But there's actually peanut perfumes, and I have one of them um, pulled up so I can read the description of it. Oh, wow. Like this, the aroma, it says, the beauty of bold Virginia nuts ensconced in sandy soils and fields of crumbling shells. Wow. And I was like, I love it. I want to know what that smells like. I feel like I might have to, you know, do some research and maybe make a purchase to see what that smell is. <laughs> Yeah, that is a really creative perfume and but I could I could see the appeal, you know, oftentimes we'll hear growers talk about that's their most favorite smell of the of of the year is when uh it's peanut harvest time and now you've got people who are trying to capture that in a bottle. So that's fun. Yeah, I love it. It says that it has notes of husks, peanuts and fields. So I'm mean, you know, has all has all of our bases covered. Yeah. But um, Lauren, I was wondering if there's anything that you were excited to find out about that we weren't able to cover in depth today. Well, there were actually two things. Um, I, I couldn't pick a favorite to tell you like which one I was most excited about. But one of them was something that some of our listeners may already be familiar with, and that's the Screwball Peanut Butter Whiskey. Uh, I think that has just taken off and gotten so popular um, outside even just the bar scene, just kind of seeing it every almost everywhere in our travels when we go out to dinners and things like that. You'll see screwball peanut butter whiskey on the menu, which is so fun to think about peanuts and peanut butter in that application. And then my second favorite um, exciting one to mention is goes back to the art world. And there is an artist named Steve Casino who actually paints figures uh, on peanut shells. So he's done like this whole line of like celebrities and cartoon characters. And some of us in the office actually have uh peanuts created by this this guy the painted as ourselves so super cute and unique and super fun and we'll definitely put a link to a story about him um in our show notes but it was a lot of fun uh, and hard to make decisions about what to talk about on this episode yeah laura that's such a good i love that those were the two that you brought up because it it just shows you how different everything is you know i mean i was able to talk about perfume you were able to talk about drinks and also like artwork but i mean this isn't even talking about all the other stuff we've talked about today and i'm sure there's a million other references within tvs and movies it just it shows you how far-reaching peanuts really are yeah, absolutely. There's there's really no place that they aren't, which is so cool when you think about um, like all the joy and comfort and excitement that people have with peanuts and peanut butter. Yeah, well, Lord, I think it's time for us to move on to my favorite part of the show, which is the trivia question. Yes. So, are you ready for it? I am. Uh, my question to you today is who was the baby Ruth candy bar named after? I feel like this question has an obvious answer, which, as you know, makes me rethink my answer. But I'm just going to go straight <laughs> with it and say the Baby Ruth candy bar was named after Babe Ruth, the baseball player from back in the day. Is that right? It's a great guess, but it's not right. Oh, man. I wouldn't even know what to guess if it wasn't that. So I'll be curious in the story behind it. So I have the description here. So it says Baby Ruth is an American candy bar created in 1920 and named after the deceased U.S. presidential daughter, Ruth Cleveland. Oh, wow. Okay. I had no idea. That is very surprising. It was so out of left field while I was researching that I was like, this is a great trivia like question because yeah. I also did not know that. I assumed it was named after Babe Ruth, but it's not. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, giving us the fact on that. <laughs> of course. You know, I got I to gotta help you all keep your facts straight on the show. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you again for listening to the Peanut Podcast. Our show's engineer and sound designer is Next Gen, and we'd also like to know that some of our guest segments may be edited for length and clarity and to comply with USDA guidelines. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on the platform you're listening on. And if you would like to find out more information about what we've talked about today, then go to nationalpeanutboard.org slash podcast. We'll see you for our next episode on May 28th. Bye-bye. Bye.